This episode of the AD History Podcast is brought to you by listeners like you, contributing through the crowdfunding platform Patreon. Learn more about how you can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash adhistorypodcast and the exclusive benefits that await your generous support. Join us in the effort to keep creating the AD history you deserve by visiting patreon.com slash adhistorypodcast. Thank you. Have you ever wondered what kind of rule it would take to reunite Rome during the crisis of the 3rd century? Well, have we got a story for you. This is the AD History Podcast, weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD. Powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. Patrick, we're back in the game. We're back into the crisis of the third century, but we're coming into some solutions instead of more problems. But with all that being said, how are you today? I am great, Paul. Yes, it feels like it's been a while. Uh, we've had some sort of stuff changing. We did The Death of Starling, which was a really good fun. It was great fun to watch that film. Oh, yeah. Even more fun to talk about it. But we're back in the depths of this crisis of the third century. And it really is the depths, but not in a bad way, because it might sound surprising, but Rome are actually going to start to find their way out of this crisis in this episode, Paul. They, they certainly are. And it's a long road. It's an incredible accomplishment, but I think we mentioned it a couple episodes back because you and I today, just for the sake of transparency here and make sure everyone understands we're on board, Patrick and I are tag teaming on this particular episode on this one topic because it is so large, it is so all-encompassing that it requires both of our attention this time. We've done that a couple of times in the past when we found it necessary, and this is definitely one of those times. And... I'm really looking forward to it. It's an amazing piece of history, and it's really the first act of two that allows Rome to extricate itself from this crisis, and it's going to be a clinic in its own right. I don't know. I'm excited. What about you? I am really excited. It's just nice to see something going well for Rome again. I felt almost bad for them. I mean, not massively, because... Rome had it good for quite a while, but it's nice to hear things going on the up and up again for them. They really couldn't get out of their own way. Yeah. To put it yeah. succinctly. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So this is going to be fun. We're going to have a whole bunch of exciting new stuff for you today. And I think you're really going to enjoy that. And with all of that out of the way, let's lay down our necessary, obligatory, now legendary AD History Podcast Ground Rules. What? Evaluate events in the context they occurred. Two, over the span of recorded history, the way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it 50 years ago. Three, nothing in history was inevitable. And four, history and the past is like a different country. Mr. Foot, Sir Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you, Paul. So I get the honor of starting today's two-part, I guess is that the term for it? Starting today's uh, episode where we're both going to talk about the same subject. And that subject is about a certain someone who came into power in this time in Rome. And if there's one thing that would be able to get Rome on its way to getting out of this crisis it's found itself in, it would have to be a good, strong, stable leader. Though, as we've seen over the past few decades, that has not really been the case. We've had no. Barak Emperor, no, Barak Emperor after Barak Emperor. And even before then, we had things like Elagabalus, you know, just absolute odd, like the days of your likes of Augustus and your Hadrians, they're far behind us. It just seems to be one version of incompetency after another. And people like to consider incompetency a lack of a certain ability. And I always think it is, in fact, a very special ability to make otherwise very straightforward and reasonably 
succinct to solve problems into something massive and much worse than it really should be. That's a really great way to define a competency. Yeah, you're quite right, Paul. And like, they have been all rubbish, but in so many different reasons. There's multiple reasons someone could be bad at something. And and these previous, like from 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 the sexually bizarre, like Ella Gablas, just the brutal and not as as wise, like the, a lot of the many Barrack Emperors have been, to just the just just the lame ducks, like many of the other ones have been as well, like the ones who've been ruling for a few months. It hasn't been that lucky. However, Rome's luck is about to change because one man was able to rise above the rest and he would be the man to save Rome from this crisis it was having in the 3rd century. That was, of course, Aurelian, or as he was known as by the end of his reign, Restutia Orbis, which of course meant the restorer of worlds. So let's begin with Aurelian's early life. And he was born in either 214 or 215 AD. Like a lot of these guys, we don't really know all too well. And he is believed to be born in the region of Moesia. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And that's in modern day Serbia or Albania. Of course, once upon a time, Paul, we would have been shocked to hear of a emperor, emperor not being more born in, in, not even in the Italian peninsula, let alone not being born in Rome. But by now, we're quite used to hearing of these foreign emperors. You know, at this point, I could be wrong, but even though they're very different figures and had very different levels of success, when you're talking about people that ascended to very high power, despite being rather low born in the empire, the only comparison I can think of off the top of my mind is Maximinus Thrax. Yes, Maximus Thrax is very similar, despite them having kind of different different reigns as emperor. And like Maximus Thrax, Aurelian is thought to have been of humble origins, even though he's come from a plebeian family. So this is still a big difference to previous Roman leaders. And he joined the military like many plebs did. And to many plebs, it was the only way to sort of make your way to get to the upper echelons of Roman society was to join the military and he rose through the ranks under Emperor Galenius. And though despite working under him, Aurelian was actually involved in Galenius's assassination. And under Galenius's successor of Claudius, Aurelian was commander of the cavalry. And that's something that's going to come up very prominently in his campaigns. He has a certain tactical genius and dare I even say mastery of cavalry tactics on the field that served him incredibly well it truly is a a total clinic in ancient <laughs> warfare as far as horseback is concerned so that's just a little foreshadowing for later so then it asks us how did aurelian become emperor if he had lent a hand in assassinating one of the previous ones and claudius's reign came to an end in 270 ad when he was killed by a plague at the time because it wasn't just the one play it wasn't just the antonine plays there was always stuff going about in rome it was a Pretty gross place. Is it believed to be the plague of Cyprian? Quite possibly. Um, part of me is debating it might still be the Antonine Plague, you know. I remember reading somewhere that it did make its way back for quite a long time afterwards. I can't remember when exactly, but the Antonine Plague came and went an awful lot way beyond when it first hit, as we most famously know the, in the way we talked about it. Yeah, I remember stumbling upon that a little bit myself. So that, that's mm. interesting, to be sure. Mm. And so Claudius dead, Quintilius, his brother, took over as emperor. Though uh, people weren't too happy about this, as we realize at this point in, his, in Roman history, Emperors taking over through lineage, through actual hereditariness, doesn't ever really seem to go too well, despite that's the official way of doing things. And he was emperor for roughly a month. That's Quintilius I'm talking about here. Quintilius ruled for about a month. And during this month, Aurelian rose to be beloved by his troops, saying he was an excellent command in the field. And this was a time in Roman history where if you were good in, if you were a good military leader, your army could elevate you to uh, emperorship and it often did and it often did and aurelian despite being so important and pivotal he was another barracks emperor and his troops declared him emperor and he gladly accepted that position and he quickly ordered Quintilius's death to make sure there wasn't another emperor to try and debate him <laughs> and this is when we get into what aurelian did in his time and what i find so interesting about this it seems like it seems he had a tick box of a checklist of all the things Rome needed sorted out. And he just went, let's sort that out. Let's sort that out. Let's sort that out. Yeah, it definitely seems like he had something of a priority checklist in terms of things he needed to accomplish to 
become later the restorer of the world. Yeah, and so, yeah, the first thing he did was deal with the Germanic tribes, which were really kicking Rome's butt in various areas of in various parts of the empire for most of this crisis. And he so he wasted little time sorting out Rome's many problems. He seized control at a mint in Siscia, which is in modern Croatia, and here he printed coins with his likeness on. And these coins were given to his men to solidify their support. And this is something we've talked about so much, Paul. Not only would soldiers be happy to receive extra money, but it's propaganda in your pocket, as we mentioned. These coins are so important. And for many of these barrack emperors, some of the only sort of proof we have of their image and likeness come from these coins. It's really interesting to see that, like, no, no matter what situation Rome was in, there was always time to get their face on a coin, it seems. You know, we have to thank Mary Beard for coming up with that little bit there because it is yeah. just so perfect. And something that is interesting, it's a reoccurring theme throughout his campaigns to restore the Roman Empire, where he's trying to get his hands on all of these mints. Mm. I mean, they become objectives for him because in addition to monetary and fiscal policy and the economics of the matter, getting your face out there is important. You know, there were times, depending on where you were in the empire, you may not necessarily have known there had been a change in power yeah. until you got your hand on some new coinage, which I think is awfully fascinating. That is really fascinating. You just all of a sudden get paid. Be like, oh, there's a new dude on my money. Must be a new emperor. Woo! Yeah. And so after putting his face on some coins, Aurelian turned his attention to the Jofungi. How am I pronouncing that right? Who knows? But the uh, Jofungi were a Germanic tribe who Rome was at war with when Claudius died. That was two emperors ago. And like, they were still fighting with them. So... He thought, well, if Claudius can defeat them, I better go sort this out. The Jafungi were successfully invading northern Italy, and they were actually heading home with their booty. However, Aurelian caught up with them and proceeded to, of course, fight them. And this led to two battles between Rome and the Jafungi. And this was the Battle of Fano and the Battle of Pavia. And Rome was successful in both these fights, and they ousted the Jafungi threat. So that's one Germanic tribe. However, there were another tribe knocking about. Well, I was going to say, though, the interesting part mm. about that story, I, I could be incorrect, but I do remember coming across this, is that when they caught the Germanic tribe, eff effectively, they caught them, to use a term, with their britches down because they were trying <laughs> to ca uh, cross the Danube at the time and they were weighed down by plunder and captured slaves. Yeah, it's like your own greed has become the better. That's what I remember reading. Like oh, the yeah. reason the reason Aurelian could catch up with them is because they just had so much booty and slaves and goodies that he'd sacked from Rome that was actually making them go slower. So that was kind of their own undoing. Their own greed kind of led to their defeat. And after de defeating the Jafungi, Aurelian turned his attention to another Germanic tribe, and that was the Vandals. Uh, the Vandals had invaded Pannonia. This was in modern-day Hungary, Croatia, and Austria. There's that. It's in other countries as well, modern-day, but just that general part of uh, modern-day Europe. Yeah, that kind of oriented on the Danube yeah, region. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of Danube region. And instead of attacking them directly, Aurelian actually scorched the earth around them. And this denied the Vandals access to food. And before too soon, they gave in themselves. So this just shows us he wasn't a one-trick pony, Aurelian. He he could oust people in a battle, but he could also like scorch the earth around them. <laughs> yes, indeed. Smoke them out, I guess, would be a, some sort <laughs> yeah, of term for it. Great term. So that was the Germans done with, or if I say Germans, that was the Germanic tribes dealt with. But there were many more issues facing Rome in this crisis. And one of them was, of course, Rome's money issues at the time. And Aurelian was more than just a battler. He actually did want to try and help fix Rome's money issues. And after these Germanic victories, Aurelian went off to Rome, Rome itself, and in Rome, the mint had become corrupt due to the lack of emperor in the city. They were like, well, there's no emperor telling us what to do, so we're just going to do what we want to do, print money for ourselves. The ultimate vacuum. Yeah, yeah, literally like the mint's taken over. That's something we haven't seen yet from Rome, so that's, that's saying quite a lot. That's something I haven't really heard in history before, the mint revolting and, uh, and doing their own thing. It's a really interesting concept. Oh, yeah. But when Aurelian came to town, a revolt broke out against the mint workers. This revolt, thankfully, didn't last too long. And Aurelian squashed this revolt and put them back to work. He was like, you're revolting because there's no emperor here? I'm here now. So 
off your pop, get back to work. And he did, like I said, wasn't only his revolt, he helped fix, he did try and help the financial situation across the Roman Empire. He cancelled debts to the treasury and burnt the relevant paperwork in a public bonfire. And he also taxed the rich profusely. These didn't solve Rome's money issues entirely, but if you're a little plebeian hard on your luck and you see your the literal paperwork saying you owe money being burnt in a public bonfire and you also hear about the rich and now being taxed an awful lot, it's going to make you happy. It was a pretty good tactic, even though it might have not helped out too much financially. I would not call it a fiscal or monetary policy that one would choose to adopt, but he was definitely playing on, relative to the time, a populist tone to yeah. the lower born in, in Roman society, where he's making a huge show of this. This is not something he's quietly doing on paper behind the scenes. He's putting on a bloody show of what he's trying to do. And it's clearly working to some extent, even though one would not call it either desirable or a monetary or fiscal policy at all. But it's definitely political showmanship. 100%. And this is stuff we've seen in Rome's past as well. Um, the, the Colosseum was built to appease the people. Something was built on Nero's solid gold house that was like to appease the people as well. I can't remember what it was exactly, but I remember... I remember that gold house being demolished quite ceremoniously and something for the people being put in its place. That could have been the Colosseum as well. There was something of a trend politically for the emperors that followed Nero to <laughs> use him as target practice every now yeah. and then just to win a few political points. And that's fair enough. He, he did some pretty bad stuff, Nero. Yeah, he wasn't great. No, and speaking of sort of constructing a Colosseum or like Aurelian, did actually do some construction in Rome as well. And as his rule went on, he defended Rome for more outside invaders. And he knew these attacks would continue. So he actually wanted Rome to have the best defenses possible. Yeah, in fact, this is even a response to a Germanic invasion that got into <sighs> the Italian peninsula, which he managed to not simply push mm. off and get rid of. He actually encircled and destroyed and basically got him thinking, Rome actually needs some physical fortifications here. There is an actual threat. Surely Rome must have had walls already. I can't believe Rome's gone over a thousand years now. We, Rome celebrated its thousandth birthday a few decades ago. Yeah. Did Rome not have walls yet? That's a really good question. What, what I do know is that the walls that he built are some of the largest, if not the largest, remaining ruins in the entire city. I mean, apparently it was quite an all-encompassing project. I have some stats about these walls, Paul. Oh, they, God, yes. <laughs> they were 21 feet high and 12 miles long. Whoa! That's huge. And you know, they are still in Rome to this day. Um, I went to Rome many years ago now. It's almost like 10 years ago since I was when in Rome. When you were in college, right? Yes, yeah, I went as a college trip when I was studying classics. I remember seeing, I didn't know what these walls were at the time, but I do remember seeing some humongous walls. And then when I Googled Aurelian, the Aurelian walls, I was like, oh, I've seen those. It, they're not hard to miss in Rome is what I'm saying. Even to this day, yeah, these walls have really stood the test of time. Not all of them granted, but they're still there. So when he built walls, he built them to last. Yeah, there seem to be some very serious, very important fortifications. It doesn't seem to be something that was put together hastily. No, not in the slightest. And that is where I'm going to leave you guys. Because obviously we're both covering Aurelian. Trust me, he did an awful lot more. And in fact, perhaps the two most important things he did are what happened next. And it's really what earned him that title of Restore of Worlds. But... Paul, I'm going to let you tackle that subject, I think, because you've done a lot more research into these bits. But that's the rise of Aurelian as well. And I just think it's incredible. Like, by now, so he came into power in 271 AD. And this must have been, what, 272, 273 by the time? Yeah, it all happened in the first half of the decade here. Yeah, yeah. This entire, this entire episode is only covering the first five years of this decade. The second half will come back to him what we missed, I sure, because there was interesting stuff here. But I said Aurelian just really needed covering in his own right. You know, before we pass it off into the next segment, something that is interesting here that we're beginning to see, and we're going to see it more in the next segment, which is that Aurelian was obviously a very capable, <laughs> clearly very successful military commander, but mm. he had a very interesting 
political horse sense, if I would describe it as <laughs> anything. He understood that there's much, much else that is going to be required of him other than the destruction of enemy armies and reconquest of Roman lands. He, he mm-hmm. may have had it in his head that I'm looking to do this altogether. It may have just gone, well, I've gone this far. It's kind of hard to tell. But one thing is for sure, he understood that there were many different components that were going to be necessary if he was going to be successful in doing this, and if he had been paying any attention at all to his contemporaries and more immediate predecessors. Because when it comes to war, and this is kind of a bigger idea that plays into this, but it more or less expresses the point I'm trying to make. It's the old Klaus Witzian maxim from yes. On War or von Krieg, if you will, in the original German. And he's just as complicated and pedantic to read in English. But the old maxim is war is the continuation of politics by other means. <laughs> And it's really true, Dutch, especially in modern mm. warfare. But in this case, it's also quite true because there's inherent connections between both of them and that in order to succeed on the battlefield strategically in the longer run, the politics and the civil side of things are going to have to be as well executed, thoughtfully planned out and incorporated as well as the battlefield successes as well. And as we go forward here, one thing that we're going to see is that Aurelian was in fact a very capable strategic thinker, specifically in terms of grand strategy, in terms of where everything is on the map, the political considerations, the thinking and moods of the people, and not simply conquering, but winning over those populaces for a number of reasons that we're going to get into more in the following segment. And this is fascinating because, you know, when we look at somebody like Maximinus Thrax, who was also not high-born, he had no appreciation. In fact, he had an outright disdain for politics and the Senate. He barely ever set foot in Rome, I think maybe once, maybe once, if at all. And we we look at him and we say, oh, you know, he's obviously not as refined as many of his contemporaries in case of Thrax, because Thrax, Obviously, he was not ethnically Roman, but he was almost barbaric in the way he conducted himself. And something that you and I pondered at the time, just kind of musing between us here on air, was his lack of more formal education and refinement Mm. responsible for the fact that he couldn't really do everything that he realistically wanted to do. Whereas in the case of Aurelian, who once again is not highborn at all, to be sure, He definitely, over time, played up this idea of truly being a man of the people, which in many respects he was, because he got where he was on pure ability and preparation meeting opportunity, the ultimate definition of luck. And he understood things in a way that someone like Maximinus Thrax, who's coming out of similar circumstances growing up and rising in the ranks, that Aurelian seems to really understand that somebody like Maximinus Thrax simply did not. Yeah, and what I find interesting is just how history, not even our modern, like, us as historians, but even uh, historians of Rome, how they've portrayed these two, especially when comparing with Maximinus Frax. Frax, uh, most most accounts of Frax describe him as like this beast lumbering of a man, like you said, almost barbaric. Frax and Aurelian were actually kind of born in similar areas. Uh, as we mentioned, Aurelian was born in modern day Serbia slash Albania. Frax was born in Thracia, which is in the Balkans region. It is today modern parts of Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey. So these two really do come from similar roots, but just how history has depicted them is so different if you look at like depictions of aurelian he's often seen as being you know he he wouldn't look down a place with the likes of augustus or hadrian but frax just he looks like he's from a different time he looks like he's prehistoric almost yeah he does have a caveman quality to him doesn't yeah. he? at least that's the way the history portrays him exactly that's what i'm saying that's the way the history has betrayed him whereas that where they've been kinder to aurelian we'll say well aurelian you know because he was the victor largely got to write the history so exactly all the benefits that come with that we'll take a little break now paul because i really want to hear what aurelian did next because that is what that's what put him in the history books we'll say that absolutely and we'll be back right after a word from anna domini this is the ad history podcast Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History PC 
and the hashtag ADHistory. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. Also, check out the AD History Podcast on Patreon. See how you can help support the show and the rewards that await you by exploring the AD History Podcast on Patreon. See the link in the description. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. And thank you, Anna. And of course, while we normally do change subject wholesale normally here, this time we're keeping on the subject of Aurelian and his reign in this decade because what Aurelian did next is what made him the beloved emperor, the restorer of worlds yesterday. And Paul, you've been doing some really deep diving into how he restored the Roman world. Well, yes, indeed. And as you were mentioning before, he has the strategic checklist. And the first part of this early part of his reign that you just discussed was somewhat laying the foundation for the major aspects of the reconquest that would become necessary to become later restorer of the world. One of those main areas, especially after he's largely gotten the Germanic tribes back on their side of the Rhine and the Danube and kind of protecting his rear, the next big target for him is the Roman East, specifically a power that we talked about in a previous episode in some depth, the Palmyran Empire, and focusing on Queen Zenobia. And in this case, Palmyra, especially at this time and before, was a true economic powerhouse. So much wealth was created in that Middle Eastern city and had been very important to Rome for a very long time. And in the previous episode, we talked about how the whole deal with King Odonathus, his successes, especially against the Sassanid Persians, where he was particularly successful, and he ultimately was allowed to become king of Palmyra, kind of one of these client kings of Rome, and then, of course, giving himself the title Shahan Shah, which, of course, was a direct challenge to, at the time, Shapur I, who held the title Shahan Shah, king of kings for the Sassanid Persians. And then, of course, once he's assassinated, his wife, who we know today as Queen Zenobia, ends up effectively taking power when their son inherits this position from his dead father, and she acts as regent for him. And because he's such a young kid, and we've heard this song many times in AD history so far, and we'll hear it many more, I can guarantee you guys, it led her to effectively gain power. And one of the issues that cropped up here, especially in the morass and chaos of the crisis of the third century, is Queen Zenobia begins to take advantage of this in numerous ways and subtly and slowly begins trying to decouple from the Roman orbit, which is something that the central government in Rome could never tolerate for any extended period of time. And effectively, not only did she manage to decouple, she ended up essentially taking control of Roman Syria, a nice chunk of Asia Minor, that south and central portion of it, and also very importantly, Egypt, which is the big breadbasket. So the East is, of course, for the most part, where the money is. We've heard this before. And when it comes to Asia Minor and the areas that the Palmyrans ended up managing to conquer was extremely lucrative in terms of the taxes that they paid. Once again, a very key area economically that generated a great deal of wealth. And Egypt, of course, is the breadbasket to the empire. And it also controls sea routes via the Red Sea that go to places like the Persian Gulf or the various western ports of the Indian subcontinent. It sounds crazy when you talk about Palmyra right there. It sounds crazy that it didn't become its own independent empire sooner, but because it had so much power and wealth behind it. Of course, eventually the East would become its own empire, but just impressive it didn't happen sooner. It almost seems destined. It seems seems odd to think it happened. To, it took so long for, for, for the Roman Empire to split West and East. It is interesting. I mean, prior to this, the question becomes, is it, would it have really been worth it? Because if they're getting a lot out of the deal and potentially the way the operation set up, even though it's very preferential in nature, the system economically, financially, and monetarily 
tilted towards Rome, there was plenty for the provinces and various regions on the frontier to buy into this thing that make a hell of a lot of sense practically. But in this case, she begins to take advantage of this and she conquers those areas. Those are big red lines at that point. Huge, huge red line. And also prior to all of this, Rome were just too strong. Like It probably wouldn't have been worth breaking away because they were too strong. But during the crisis, it made all the sense to break away from them. It did. Remember, when it came to Rome, they were very much into the carrot and stick approach. We can do it the easy way. We can do it the hard way. And the easy way was certainly preferable, but there are many times where others chose the hard way and they got it the hard way. And then some. So Palmyra was very much on top of Aurelian's strategic interest. And so the way he ended up doing this was through an extremely strategically creative invasion. This was in 272, where you had two major forces. The way he looked at this campaign was, I need to create two separate discrete fronts in order to accomplish what I need to accomplish, which of course is the recapture of that portion of Asia Minor. You want to get back Antioch and you need to get back to Egypt. Now, if you just went with a signal axis of advance starting, and in his case, he was camping out in the winter prior in what we know today as Istanbul or Byzantium or Constantinople or whatever the hell you want to call it. If you just went on that signal axis of advance, with the hope of reconquering all of those points that I just mentioned, it would potentially be a long and bloody road, and it would not necessarily end the way you want. You might succeed, but the price of peace would have been terribly high, and there was a better way of doing this, and he found a better way of doing this. So his major point of departure in 272 was from Byzantium, and he wanted to go through Central Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and recapture that area. But there was a second front that was in many ways far more interesting than this. His second front was led by a man by the name of General Probus, I believe his name was. And the second front was in fact an amphibious assault on the northern Mediterranean coast of Egypt. And in doing so, it was a large fleet that they sent over. And they arrived in and around that northern coast, kind of near the Nile Delta, in early spring of 272. And it took him about two or three months before he had a very strong foothold in the area, and even to go and capture something that's as strategically significant a city as Alexandria, in addition to other reinforcements that became necessary. Because something that's important to mention, I don't care if it's modern warfare, I don't care if it's ancient warfare, Amphibious assaults are incredibly difficult to pull off. And so while there's not a heck of a lot known more about the specifics of the second front landing in Egypt, we do know that it was successful. And like I said, about two to three months before he had a true foothold, it took quite a few reinforcements. The fighting was actually quite bitter from everything we can tell, but he did eventually capture Alexandria, which is huge. It's, if Rome is the capital, Alexandria is capital 1A. Yeah. And Istanbul isn't really doing its thing or whatever you want to call it that hasn't quite picked up yet there before it would become the actual second capital Alexandria was definitely the one beforehand and so the idea here is once that second front was successfully established Probus and his armies would march east along the northern Egyptian Mediterranean coast turn northwards when you start getting into Palestine and then eventually meet the main axis of advance starting from Byzantium going south through Central Asia Minor, and then eventually meeting at that point of Roman Sirius. It's kind of like the hammer hitting the anvil. Yeah, it's definitely the more unexpected route round. Yeah, it was very creative, and it turned out to be extremely well executed, yeah. which was really important. No, I was going to say, and what you said in regards to the Punic Wars, it reminds me of, um, obviously that was the other team going against Rome, but it reminds me of uh, Hannibal Barker's route across the Alps to get to Italy in the Second Punic War, taking the more unexpected route. That's something that we may talk about at some point because it's a really, it's an interesting campaign. Best of BC, go join on Patreon. You got that right. <laughs> so in this case, before Aurelian even takes off, he's taking active measures to make sure that his rear is secured because there had been frequent incursions into the Balkans from a number of powers. Probably one of the most notable ones would be the Goths that have given them the most trouble. 
And of course, you also have the Germanic tribes when you start getting into northern Italy, what we know today as Switzerland, Austria, all those fun parts. You go further west than even that in Western Europe, and you have yourself the Gallic Empire. And so Aurelian understood that in order for his campaign against Zenobia to succeed, everything behind him had to be secure. So what he ended up doing was he actually withdrew all of the Roman forces that were garrisoned in Dacia, along with various other officials, and brought them back into the Balkans. And it ultimately shortened the border that they needed to defend in that area. So that way you could redeploy forces and you had a smaller border to defend. And so he left a sizable number there as far as the Balkans were concerned. He left a sizable number of troops in and around northern Italy just to protect against any potential Germanic incursions. And then he also put a numerous force in what we know today as southern France that Rome still actually controlled to keep an eye on the Gallic Empire at the time. Because they were knocking about as well. Uh, absolutely. You had to keep all of these things in mind because what's in front of you is not going to become nearly as important if you have trouble behind you for numerous reasons, whether that means redeploying forces to go put down a revolt or an incursion or in any way screwing with your supply lines. These are major factors that Aurelian is taking into consideration here. And so he takes off and he begins his march into Asia Minor, which was initially quite successful. And his whole campaign from there is really quite interesting. In this case, something that he was doing throughout the war, even before we get more into the greater fighting that's going on here, he is propagandizing the campaign back at home, specifically in the war against Zenobia and the Palmyrenes, which is to say that he's selling to his domestic audience, as it were, the Roman subjects, that Zenobia and the Palmyrenes are an existential threat that she is a barbarian, and that they are fighting an external enemy, as opposed to what they were really doing, which was engaging in a Roman civil war. So why do you think that's the case? Was he scared to like let the people know that Rome was at war with itself? And it just makes me wonder, like, I wonder how much the average Joe, your average plebeian, how much they would have known what was going on in the wider world around them. Would they have known how well this crisis would they have been? Or would they have known Rome was splitting up like this? Who knows? Well, mass communication being what it was at the time. Yeah. There's a number of factors. Obviously, they're not going to get detailed information. Mm. Word will pass through them or some kind of news will get out. And, and of course, the central government is always very careful to message how this all happens under the direction of the emperor. But I think the idea here had a lot to do with the idea. And this is just me just kind of putting on my analysis goggles that as far as he was concerned, the idea of creating a external enemy is a very successful way to garner and solidify support for the war effort. A lot of times, and this is not so much the case here, obviously, but the same general idea applies, which is, say you have a fairly brutal regime. One of the ways that you can continue making yourself a legitimate claim to power and that people won't necessarily come up and challenge you is the idea that we need to band together in order to fight this great external enemy. I mean, that's one of the many reasons why if you only look at a place like North Korea, they look at the United States as the American bastard. <laughs> we haven't been at war with them for almost seven decades, and there's absolutely no desire to do so. But for the Kim regime, having that really omnipotent, great continual threat helps galvanize support for whatever it is that they're doing. So same idea applies, albeit a clearly different situation. So I hope that answers your question. I mean, yeah. that's basically the way I'm looking at it. That, and you're framing it in the idea of a civil war in that case, there's even a chance you may get sympathizers at home. Exactly. It's hard to raise morale for a civil war, I imagine. We're going to war. Who'll be fighting? Ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And he even made Zenobia out to be a barbarian, even though she clearly wasn't. She did have Roman lineage, and I believe there were portions of her family that were of the senatorial class, even though she was clearly more Arab ethnically yeah, in many respects. Like we tend to associate barbarian with like North European Germanic people. She's, she's as far from barbarian as they can be. In many respects. So yeah. I think that's particularly helpful for him in this case. 
it's really quite fascinating in that regard. So as he is advancing, initially he's not meeting any resistance. The people that he is encountering are opening the gates for him, and there's no great resistance. And obviously, that's really good news to Aurelian, because if you don't have to fight, huh, why would you? Makes things easier for everyone involved. Entirely. This changed, however, at a very specific point in South Central Asia Minor, and that is at the Siege of Tayana, which was along the axis of advance for his armies, and they did not initially welcome him at all. In fact, they initiated what would become a weeks-long siege. And originally, Aurelian promised his troops that when Tyana fell and the garrison and the siege was over, that he would allow them to plunder the city and take the booty that many of them joined up to take. However, he had a change of mind and a change of heart. He came to the very important revelation, and this is one of those examples of how he was had very keen political considerations as well, that when the city did fall, and apparently it was due to a traitor who basically escaped the gates of the wall and basically ran on the rest of the city and said, here, that's where the wall is weakest. When it, Tiana eventually fell, he told his troops actually to hold back, because his thinking was that if we set an example where we are genuine liberators and not conquerors, there's a very strong possibility that we may run into less resistance as we go forward because he knew that military success against the Palmyrians was no guarantee. They were extremely militarily capable. And so when it finally fell, naturally at first, his troops were very pissed off because they considered this a broken promise. The way the story goes is that he actually addressed his troops to let them in on his thinking. Because originally he is famed to have said, we will kill even the dogs. <laughs> and so he gets up in front of his troops and says something roughly akin to, if we sack them and we mistreat them now, we're going to be resisted every step of the way. And apparently, according to the story, and I'm sure this has been mythogized or you know made somewhat into legend, but it gets the idea across. When he said before that we would kill even the dogs, Apparently, he broke the tension by saying, okay, we'll kill just the dogs. <laughs> and apparently, it broke their mood, and they didn't end up sacking the city. So, Tiana ends up being this exceptional example of Aurelian saying, hey, if we present ourselves and truly act as liberators and not conquerors, we're going to make this an easier fight and not pick fights that are unnecessary along the way. But did Tyana and the rest of uh, the Palmyrian Empire, ev Empire even want to be want to be liberated? I, were they not happy being their own thing at this time, or like, were they thinking, "Hmm, this isn't really working out. We should really be part of Rome again"? I'm just curious. If you have any knowledge on that fact? I don't necessarily know that there was that much self determination available to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not the ones that the uh, who's controlling the sword, as it were. Yeah. But they knew that there were definitely benefits to being under a properly administered and properly running Roman Empire. They had been under that rule for centuries at this point. Yeah. So there was definitely a clear Roman footprint and claim to that area. And the fact that they were not being mistreated spoke volumes. So it's the idea of winning hearts and minds. You, you would have thought someone would have had this idea already, Paul. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so he continued this practice when eventually he came to fight at Antioch, which was basically the major pitch battle against the Palmyrans, in which a variety of exceptional tactics were undertaken by Aurelian that really threw off the Palmyrian armies really quite well. I'm not going to go into exceptional detail about that because this is a little bit more big picture than not, but when they did eventually capture Antioch, once again, they were welcome because they were acting as liberators. They were looking to win hearts and minds. And on top of that, when he eventually took the city, and this was one of his big goals, he also got his hand on the all-important mint, which was the yes, last major mint in Roman territories that were not currently under Roman control that he did not possess himself. And once again, we talked earlier about the importance of that. And once Aurelian has Antioch in hand, which is essentially the administrative capital of Roman Syria, had been for a long time, well-developed city, it has a history. You've heard it quite a few times spoken of in the show. Mm. And so when the Palmyran forces retreat, they actually retreat 
to Palmyra itself. And of course, there is the pursuit in the case of Aurelian and his forces, in which they managed to surround the city. And this was at a point where Zenobia herself knew that based on her situation and the resources that she had available and the position of Aurelian's forces, that the only way she could potentially extricate herself from the situation was from outside help, outside help that she desperately needed. When it came to that, what she ended up doing is she tried to flee. And in doing so, she was attempting to flee in the hope that she could have a meeting face-to-face -face with the Sassanid Persian king, Bahram I, who was the successor of Shapur I. And at this point, and certainly in this decade, the Sassanid Persians are having their own little internal power struggle as well. The thing was, she never got there. She never got there. And she was taken into captivity by Aurelian. With all said and told, she was never truly able to extricate herself. So under Roman rule, again, there was a later revolt in 273, but we'll get back to that in a moment because that's a rather big point. So several things occurred after her capture and the effective defeat of the vanguard, more or less, of the Palmyran Empire and its forces. One of the major things he did was come to something of an entente, which is a fancy way of saying understanding with Bahram I of the Sassanid Persians to better establish a coherent and mutually agreed upon border for the shared frontiers between the Sassanid Persians and the territories in the Roman East, which is awfully important because that had been a major point of contention quite a bit now during the third century. We fought a great deal with the Sassanid Persians. They have made themselves quite dynamic and a real thorn strategically in Rome's side. When that occurred, he ended up taking Zenobia, and we're going to talk more about her fate a little bit later, and mm. her major cohort, and they brought her to Essene, I believe is the city, and they actually put them on trial publicly. On trial, Zenobia was actually, I would say, not acquitted. They showed mercy to her, but not out of any genuine sense of mercy. And, of course, they executed her higher-ranking officials and supporters and things of that nature. The reason Aurelian wanted her alive was because he wanted to publicly humiliate her. He needed to destroy her image as a powerful and dynamic force as an example to anybody else that may still have had sympathies with her in the region that she was cooked. Let's put it this way. She was powerful enough for him to go to that extent that he needed to make a whole public show of it. It's so interesting. This is the same idea coming from the man who had the same idea to be liberators, to not kill everyone and to, to free people and be like the savior where here. He could have done a very similar thing with Queen Zenobia and given her peace to show, maybe even show the Gallic Empire that, hey, we're going to be friendly with you. But no, he made a huge example out of her. And I, it's somewhat questionable to an extent, you know, we have such a good image of Aurelian, but it's not the nicest thing to do to someone. I would say that there's a favorable image to Aurelian mm. based on what he managed to accomplish, but mm. war, especially civil war in particular, mm. are the nastiest of conflicts. He basically, if I were to describe it as anything, for the most part, at least in, in terms of his initial attitudes of clemency to the people, the thinking probably was along the lines of, I'm not going to hold you accountable for the misdeeds of your leaders. So Zenobia is not one who would be subject to any sort of mercy in that regard. She is still a threat to him. And interestingly enough, they not only make an example of her there, they actually put her on display in irons for three days in Antioch. And she actually has to follow the army along its next campaigns, once again, further south into Palestinian, and then, of course, back into Asia Minor, then up into the Danube, then back into Syria, and then back over the Gulf. She's following them the whole way before they actually get to Rome and have the big procession. It sounds almost like the walk of shame um, Cersei Lann Lannister has to do in Game of Thrones. I'm always ending up referencing Game of Thrones in this podcast. How can you not? It's so much of that show is borrowed from the history books, and it's just another great example of that. Absolutely. So he basically gets to Palmyra after about six months, which is really a, a heck of an accomplishment. Mm. What he looked to do, for all intents and purposes, 
is he wanted to do everything possible to avoid any further seeds of potential uprising in the future. So naturally, he makes this show of her, and he also comes to this understanding with Bahram I of the Sassanid Persians, because at this point, he has bigger fish to fry. He wants to do everything possible to make sure that there's no issues when he goes on to his next point on the strategic hit list, as it were. And so from there, he puts somebody in charge there as governor of Syria by the name of Marcellinius. This is one of his most trusted men. That's why he left them there. He's not worried yeah. that he's going to get too big for his britches and then try to usurp him. In this case, after Aurelian takes off and he heads back north, and he's back into Asia Minor, he's back into the Balkans. Once again, specifically in Palmyra, there are still some remaining remnants who, in Aurelian's absence, want to take over again, and they want to try to do it through Marcellinius, that most trusted of Aurelian's men. And Marcellinius is not having any of it. He kind of wax and wanes a little bit, just kind of fawning the idea to buy some time, but he manages to get the message out to Aurelian that there is something a-brewing here. And once he caught wind of this message from Marcellinius, he was in the southern Balkans at that juncture, and he made a 180, basically roughshod, from the Balkans down back into Syria. And that's a long distance by foot. Mm. And he's yeah. doing it roughshod. You're doing it with forced marches. And when he got there, he literally took the city without any fight. In fact, what ended up happening is Marcellinus ended up getting deposed because he wasn't going to cooperate. And they put their own puppet there, who is really not even worth mentioning. And when he gets back there, he takes Palmyra out of fight. And he is so enraged by what happens. And once again, this is another demonstration of easy way, hard way. Because prior mm. to this, he is showing mercy. He is being a liberator. But in this case, you're becoming a troublemaker again, no more. So unlike the first time when Palmyra was spared, he told his troops, sack the city and take everything, everything that you can take. And Palmyra after that would never be trouble for him again. So he's showing carrot and stick very, very clearly here. Examples tend to work better if you're so nice beforehand. Like when you see someone who's been kind to you snap all of a sudden, it, it makes you feel a lot more stressed and whoa than someone who's always being annoying. Like like when the nice quiet teacher has a massive shout up at school, like that always shocked you more than when the angry teacher always ended up shouting. And that's the kind of vibe I'm getting here. Yeah, it makes you almost want to piss your pants. Yeah. Because it just scares the hell out of you. Yeah. And on top of that, there was also a smaller uprising in Alexandria that was led by a man by the name of Firmus, who was still largely loyal to Zenobia. And Aurelia did manage to defeat him in what was apparently some pretty nasty fighting and took back the city itself and actually really damaged some of the wealthiest parts of Alexandria. And interestingly enough, Firmus, when he was captured by Aurelian's forces, he was sentenced to death by straight-out strangulation. Wow. Yeah. Really, really, really brutal stuff. Gosh. Tell me about it. Now we're getting to the final piece of the puzzle, which is the reconquest of the Gallic Empire. And we did touch about the, on this about the last couple episodes when we were focusing on the Gallic Empire, but we're going to look at it a little bit more in the big picture here as it pertains to Aurelian and the bigger Roman picture to kind of round things out. Once Palmyra and the Roman East are largely under control as far as he could see, and would really remain so for the remainder of Israel, albeit short, as he had to go to the other splinter state, the Gallic Empire. And in 274, 275, that is precisely what he did. Aurelian and his men did defeat the Gallic forces in modern-day France. Basically, the battlefield was in northeastern France, almost kind of near Paris almost. And the Gallic troops at that time, of course, they were former Roman troops, and they were pretty darn experienced. They had dealt with war in a mm -hmm. variety of ways, even though they still had all the issues that so many of the Roman military had, regardless if you were in a splinter state or still formally in the empire itself. And in this case, this is something that's rather interesting. The leader of the Gallic Empire, Tetricus I, apparently before they even met in battle, he sent an emissary to Aurelian, offering to surrender and peacefully reincorporate back into the Roman Empire. Aurelian was obviously extremely weary of this particular reproach mon, and so he tested him. He said, okay, I'll consider this, but in order to do so, you need to give up the entirety of your army. <laughs> you have to serve them up. That is how you're going to put the proof in the pudding. This did not happen. 
But they came and they had their set engagement, which we talked about a few episodes back. And the interesting thing is that Tetricus, during the battle, apparently, even defected over to Aurelian from his own armies in combat. Think about that. The leader of Not your bad, yeah. power, the leader of your armies, <laughs> has literally crossed the lines. Yeah. There's a bit much faith in, in him, does it? It does not speak Nothing. well of him. No, no. To be sure. He was very interested in his own neck. And in fact, it did save his own neck in many ways. But that yeah. didn't stop the fight. Not at all. Even though the Gallic forces were very well tested and very capable. Remember, these are former Roman troops. They know what they're doing. Their combat prowess had a very large profile of accomplishments and experiences, which are very important to remember here. However, Aurelian was successful in defeating Gallic forces in that pitch battle, which led to the reincorporation of the Gallic Empire at that point back under Roman control. The problem was, even though you get back what is modern day France, southern England, the Iberian Peninsula and Roman Hispania, even though they started as a part of the Gallic Empire, did not remain it through its entirety of its time. It's back in Roman control once again. But through the defeat of the Gallic armies, for a time, strategically, it left Rome, and now since Aurelian is effectively controlled the entire empire again, weakened against potential Germanic incursions across the Rhine and the Danube there because the force that he defeated was the one that was keeping them on their side of the friggin' river. But at this point, he has managed to restore the world, as it yeah. were, and he was going to make sure that his subjects were fully on board with it, and this thing was going to be celebrated to the hilt, my friends, to yes. the very hilt. And so he eventually does return to Rome, and apparently it was one hell of a spectacle. And in doing so, and this is also part of the fate of Queen Zenobia, is that she was part of this procession, as was Tetricus, who crossed the lines, as well as his son, and they were forced to march in front of Aurelian's chariot. As the story goes, when she was marching in front of them, she was forced to wear gold chains that shackled her, of course, and she was weighed down by rubies and diamonds to the point where it was seriously hampering her ability to march. So they were being paraded front and center, not just as this is what I accomplished, but as examples. Yeah. And a warning that this ends here. There's no question. The fate of Zenobia here and Tetricus and his son are actually quite interesting. Mm. So they've obviously been made an example of. Aurelian, for the most part, has the place under control. There are going to be issues that are going to crop up, but there's nothing compared to what he just managed to accomplish or what was the case even starting in the beginning of the decade of the 270s. But from what all we can tell is that after the procession and, and the big event that happened, like I said, it was a big thing. Apparently there are stories of his forces even going out and giving away bread to the common people. <laughs> this was a party and Aurelian was the party master. He was the MC. He was the guy. We saw him. He, he, he was able to please the common people with the burning of the tax papers, or the debt papers, you know. He knows how to put on a spectacle. Yeah. He re this was definitely his wheelhouse. Yeah. And, and that's part of his political genius. And so what happens to Zenobio? Well, it's interesting as far as we can tell, because this is not entirely clear, but this is largely what is believed to have happened. Once it's all cooled down, he actually, Aurelian, gave Zenobia an estate that was east of Rome. It was gifted to her. And she ended up apparently marrying a Roman senator and having a few kids and was incorporated into the senatorial class of life. Even though she already had familial ties to it, she was able to live her life out in obscurity and relative peace as far as we know. And as far as Tetricus went, he actually appointed Tetricus a governor of a very docile region in the southern Italian peninsula. So he got what he needed from them, to be sure, but he also sweetened the deal at the end, which is an interesting way of going about it. He got them both with the stick and the carrot basically at the same time. And I find that interesting. Something I remember reading about in 
regard to keeping his empire under control. He's actually kind of started a new religion slash cult following this, the Sol Invictus. Did you do much research on this, Paul? I did not, but it wouldn't surprise me because that's something that certain emperors yeah. definitely got their hands into and were really in, all in on that. But it sounds yeah. like you have some insight. Yeah, so this was the Sol Invictus. This was afterwards. He, it, it, Sol Invictus was a god beforehand. He was a sun god of the Roman Empire. It means the unconquering sun. Aurelian found him this god to be of extreme importance and put him at the front and center of his regime. It was just another tactic to keep the empire under one god, basically. Keep them all agreeing with one god, the unconquering sun. And it'll keep everyone happy. And that was just something else I thought would be worthwhile adding there. That's another way he helped restore the world by putting everyone in agreement that the sun god, Sol Invictus, is number one. Sol Invictus is actually going to become something of an interesting figure and concept later when we get to one Constantine and the whole Christianity yeah. thing later yeah. on. So remember yeah. Sol Invictus from here, because he's going to be quite important, to yeah. say the least. So you were asking me earlier, why didn't Aurelian extend this mercy and clemency to Zenobia? Mm. And the answer is, he didn't do it at the time. He still had things that he needed from her. But he did show mercy at the end, as he did with Tetricus. He was a very clever person, we'll say that much. You clearly, he knew what he was doing, which is an awful lot more than a lot of the previous emperors did. Uh, by a very, very wide margin. And now we get into the matter of his death, because this all happens in a five-year period. This is truly amazing how this all came together for him. Mm. And something that should be known about Aurelian on the civil administrative side is he had very little toleration for corruption. Corruption from his soldiers, corruption from civilian officials and he dealt with them harshly. And I don't know if it was simply a cover for him getting people into certain positions that he wanted. That's not terribly clear. I don't think it's as obvious as, say, Domitian and his anti-corruption mm -hmm. campaign, which was just more naked consolidation of power, <laughs> thinly veiled. But in this case, when it came to Aurelian, he was on his way to handle another cropping up of an issue in the Balkans. And it was his secretary, in fact, who seemed to come to the belief that his own misdeeds and his own corruption was going to put him in the crosshairs of his boss. And so he took a move to try to save his own skin, which is, as the story goes, he made up a falsified document because this guy was the administrative right-hand man for Aurelian. He was a secretary. He's not a secretary necessarily as we would understand it today, but... He was certainly in charge of a lot of the major administrative issues that went along with the emperor, both civil and military. Secretary, how we use it in a political term. In a way. Yeah. In, in a way. It was a position. It wasn't so much what we would call secretarial work as we understand mm. it today. I think that's a pretty, a pretty decent way of putting it, actually. And yeah. so the way the ruse went was he created a falsified document that was basically a list of figures to be assassinated for potential corruption. And he included several major figures, some of which were generals, and they bought into this. And then just outside of Byzantium, I believe, they acted on this falsified information and assassinated Aurelian in 275. So his accomplishments is amazing. From the Roman point of view, he's legitimately the restorer of the world. He is the first major act that leads to the Roman crisis of the third century and Rome extricating themselves from that crisis. But he ultimately got done in by his inner circle that was trying to save its own neck and apparently one individual in particular. Something of an ignominious end for somebody who accomplished so much in such a short period of time. Truly yeah. a shooting star, if I would describe it anyway, in terms of analogy. Yeah, like what would have happened if he just wasn't assassinated then? Like it was only emperor for five years, but... What a five years, man. What a roller coaster. It, it totally was. And it leads us to a few interesting questions here. And the first one I'm going to pose, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on this, Patrick, mm. having listened to this, how, you and I both having researched it as we have. And the first question I'm curious about is, what made Aurelian so effective, both on the battlefield and dealing with the civil side? You have to wonder, don't you? Because despite the fact he was just another barracks emperor, he had qualities just so many of the other barrack emperors did not. You're wondering, like, what? Maybe it was something in his upbringing? Like he just understood the civil side of things more. He had more tactical brain. Or maybe 
it's just simply because he's seen what came before him. You know, he wasn't Maximus Frax, as we mentioned beforehand. He was the first Barrack Emperor. He had no idea what he was doing. But that was that was a good few decades ago now. That must have been, what, almost 30 years by now? Maybe even more than that. Yeah. like It's at least three decades. Aurelian's had at least three decades of learning from previous Barrack Emperor's mistakes of what to do and what not to do. So maybe it's just the fact that he came in after seeing all these mistakes, seeing, oh, cool. I won't do what they did. Maybe it was a fact like that. He just had more time on his side and more, not more experience himself, but more people who experienced what he had experienced already. So he realized what to not do. It does leave one to wonder exactly mm. what lessons he took from the past. Yeah, lessons from the past. Gosh, boy, you're always so much better at succinctly explaining things I mumble about for. <laughs> Patrick, you are <laughs> one of the true original thinkers that I have ever Gosh. met. So I well, take I've... that as a very high compliment. I might be the original thinker, but you take those thoughts and make them much more presentable and succinct. <laughs> Praise from Caesar. <laughs> Works out both ways. So that's definitely a possibility. Hmm. Off the top of my head, I think, huh, maybe maybe he just learned from previous rulers' mistakes. And definitely something that we were talking about earlier is he definitely mm. did seem to have a keen appreciation of what was required of him, not just on the battlefield as a military strategic thinker or a tactician in combat, but what was required of him as a politician. Mm. Because in every respect, he is both general and politician, without a doubt. And being able to better understand what was necessary in regards to achieving a form of popular support mm. and understanding acting as true liberators, winning hearts and minds, that he also seemed to understand the idea of not making unnecessary enemies mm. and helping yes. pave a path of least resistance along the goals that he legitimately wanted to achieve. He almost went back to Rome's roots. You know, we, we've always said, we've said in this episode, you can do it the <laughs> easy way, you I can do that. it the hard way. And he just realized that that's what, that's what brought Rome to the dance anyway for these centuries. And he realized, oh, we should just, and then they kind of lost that way for so long with all these barrack emperors. It was only just the hard way. It was, he basically brought the easy way back in, back into the Roman fold. And it worked. It worked for them all those, the, those centuries beforehand. It surprisingly worked again. Who would have thought? It, it's true enough. And so, what other question that I think is really important for you and I to consider? And for you at home listening or wherever you may be listening, or if you're listening on YouTube, leave your thoughts in the comments on this one. After studying the crisis of the third century for Rome in depth to the extent that we did, because it was the headliner of this particular century, hmm. there's no question about it. What have we learned about Rome through this struggle that maybe we didn't necessarily know before, but has become exceptionally clear to us now? Looking at this, obviously in hindsight, but getting greater insights about the empire by virtue of how we have examined this conflict and these set of events so far. That's a great question to leave the audience with. But if I do sum it up succinctly, they do not do well under pressure. <laughs> Potentially. Yeah. I mean, if you if you become that large, you better be able to handle some yeah. kind of pressure. But it feels like the moment, the moment there's one crack, it just seems to all fall to pieces. I think it's more cumulative than that. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. They were not a tin pot Roman Empire. What I would say is a few things in terms of, at least for me, and my appreciation for what mm. Rome was as an empire, is that it's amazing to me, looking at this conflict, how many different types of people lived as subjects under Roman rule. How many different peoples and ethnicities and traditions and religions and culture, because there was definitely clear Romanization. That did mm. happen. But in some cases, it genuinely fused with what existed there before or existed from those people that were native to those areas anyway. And it's amazing that when you see this conflict boil up as it did, seeing just how many of these various pieces that had come together of all these different people under the central government, under the auspices and control and rule of a Roman central government. It really makes you appreciate just how cosmopolitan and wide-reaching this empire is. We know about the geography and just how vast a territory they controlled. They are, for all intents and purposes, an ancient superpower. Hmm. But all of the different people that it included that weren't necessarily coming out of the truly ethnic Latin playbook and how that 
further fused and evolved over time with prolonged Roman rule and how that all just kind of really came to the surface here. I was saying, couldn't have put it any better myself, Wes, but that's much better than my single, they did do well under pressure remark. The other thing, and that we've mentioned it before, is yes. also very much from a governmental standpoint, makes you appreciate the accomplishment of successful, peaceful, coherent, and established formal systems of transition to power, which at its yes. heart was very much part of one of the main issues that created this crisis in general. Just Rome in general, as yeah, as you said, we mentioned before, just Rome never had an easy transition of power. It was just always up in the air, what's going to happen next? They never had that truly entrenched. I mean, they did. It was supposed to be hereditary, but that never actually bloody happened, did it? Well, I mean, it was hereditary, and with the exception of the, of the so-called five good emperors who were just yeah. coming up with ad hoc solutions around it for various yeah. reasons. But it turned into a hereditary business. It did, yes. It just shows you just how important that transition of power always is and always will be despite the fact how much we take it for granted rome is proof that when you don't have that in place things can get bad very quick it does and the one other thing that i think is really worth mentioning here though i don't think they necessarily would have agreed about it at the time this is certainly us looking back and we fully recognize that and we've talked about the concept of hereditary transfer of power and how problematic that can be because just because you are the offspring of a current good ruler doesn't mean that you are going to be any good at it yourself. Oh, Ruling, good, yeah. especially when you're doing it in a very authoritarian manner, is a skill. Yeah. And it's not a skill that everyone possesses, or even if they did, maybe not everybody's even necessarily interested in. And when you look at a case study like Aurelian, and you see where he came from, these really rather modest roots, you know, he was essentially a plebeian. He was nobody. He yeah. worked his way up through his own abilities. And this is not some grand thumping speech for the benefits of meritocracy, but it definitely speaks to some clear benefits that come with a society that actually has upward mobility because talent can come from anywhere. Just because you're a member of the senatorial class, just because you are an equestrian, just because you have the so-called blood to rule doesn't mean you have the mind and ability to do so. And when you have a society that really, and this is going to be true for a long time, the Romans are certainly not just guilty of it. We still deal with it in certain respects today, but talent can come from anywhere. And when you're only choosing and the only people who are qualified is from this very small pool, you can end up in a very bad situation. And you look at somebody like Aurelian who was not highborn and was not from the Italian peninsula, and you see, well, that really helped, didn't it? That's a very American response of you, Paul. And yeah, while I, I, agree I can't with it, <laughs> extricate it from myself if I tried. <laughs> and while I, I, I do agree with it, I have to say that no, it should be hereditary and there should be a big <laughs> crown involved as well. <laughs> Patrick, I think you just kicked off a constitutional crisis. <laughs> oh, we can worry about it next time. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, this is a lot of fun. Us here, you there, and we'll be back right after a word from Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast. Well, that does it for us today. Patrick, where can people find us? You can find me personally, primarily on Instagram at NameExplainYT. But you can also find me on Twitter at NameExplainYT. And of course, on YouTube, search NameExplain. What about you, Paul? In addition to my usual work at TGNR at TGNReview.com, you can find me at my Twitter handle at PKD in history, as well as my reader submitted World War II Q&A column, The World War II Brain Bucket, where I answer all World War II related questions, which if you are on YouTube, we will have a link down in the description. That's all today from myself. Goodbye. Thank you and take care. Yes, thank you all so much. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at ADHistoryPC, as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash ADHistoryPodcast and Instagram as AD History Podcast. 
In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. For Paul and Patrick, thank you for listening to the AD History. We'll see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.